grace to you all this morning, peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. So, I, I don't know if you saw the movie The Best Exotic Miracle Hotel. I've talked about it before. One of the great lines, did I already use this line on you? When the, when the folks get into the hotel, and the place is a, a wreck, and the guy who's trying to fix it up, who owns it, um, Sonny is his name, comes out, and uh, he's, a, he's accused of photoshopping the brochure to make the hotel look much better than it was. And, and obviously his guests are upset because they came to a place that was not what they expected. And he said to them, we have a saying here in India, everything works out in the end. And if it hasn't worked out, then it's not the end. <laughs> I love that phrase, right? Now you can use that phrase to put off a lot of things. But there's a certain sense in which it's absolutely true. Whereas we want results right away, we want things to work out right away. It doesn't always happen like that. And so maybe it's not yet the end. Not yet, things have not yet played themselves out. We have to be patient, difficult for us. We like the immediate results. When Sonny says this in the movie, if you're watching the movie, you kind of think, well, now he's just being self-serving. He's just meeting his own ends, trying to put his guests off. I wonder if people looked at Jesus that way, too. A little bit out of touch, maybe. Here he is going to the leader of the synagogue's house, and because he's delayed on the way in the interaction with the woman who was sick, in the time of that delay, Jairus' little girl dies. And people come up to Jairus and they tell him, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter is dead. And Jesus, upon hearing this, says, no, she's not dead. She's just asleep. And then he gets to the house and, and the morning has already begun. And it sounds like even now it's in full swing. And people are lamenting the death of this little girl, 12 years old, and, and what it will mean for her family. Just on the very edge at 12 in the society of that time, to get married, to come into her full womanhood, and yet her life is cut short. And again, in the midst of that commotion, Jesus says to those who are gathered together, why are you making all this commotion? The girl's not dead, she's just sleeping. And they laugh at him. They laugh. He doesn't know, he's just being optimistic. He's unaware of the realities of life, of the way things work out too much of the time. He's not coming to grips with what is. He's pretending that things are somehow better, different, out of touch. That's how Jesus must have seemed to the crowds gathered around the house. Indeed, that's how the disciples treated him earlier that very day. When in the midst of the crowd, a woman who's sick and desperate comes up to Jesus and just touches his robe without saying a word to him, reaches her hands through the press of the crowd and just grabs a little bit of his robe and immediately she's healed. And Jesus feels that power of healing go out of him into the woman and he turns around and he says, touched me. And the disciples look at Jesus and they say to him, do you see all these people around you? How can you say, who touched me? Jesus, come on, get real. Life isn't always what we want it to be. We struggle with that, don't we? We struggle with that. We hear it in the psalm as the psalmist struggles between the power of God's love and grace and the realities of his or her own life. To the point where the psalmist even has to say to God in that wrestling of faith, God, what good is it to you if I die? It's much better for you to keep me around so I can tell people what a wonderful God you are. Don't let me slip through your fingers, please. And we get that sense of desperation that the psalmist is wrestling with in terms of the value and the length of their life. Which probably for most of us is never quite long enough. We hear it too in the writer of Lamentations. This is the book that begins 
How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become. The writer is lamenting over the destruction of Jerusalem by a more powerful army. <laughs> and yet, you would never believe that these words that Marianne read to us this morning come from that same book, which affirmed God's power and grace. And then that sort of encouraging, but also a little bit confusing phrase, that God does not willingly grieve or afflict anyone. I'm not sure what that means. Well, I know what the writer is trying to say, that when bad things happen, it's not because God is trying to get us. But then, just before that, the writer said that grief, that God sometimes grieves us, but not willingly. And it's almost in that sort of double speak that the writer of Lamentation shares. We hear his or her own grief at the inability to explain the situation as it confronts them. This is our struggle as people of faith. To be able to identify where God's hand is in our lives, how God is active, and why it's not always for good. Indeed, the stories about Jesus' healing today raise those very questions for us. Jairus' daughter, dies, and Jesus raises her from the dead. This woman is sick for 12 years, and Jesus heals her. And as we struggle, like the psalmist and the writer of Lamentations, to be able to find the fingerprints of God in our lives, we ask the question that comes from deep in our hearts and from the pain of our human experience, then why not everyone? then why not me? Then why not those I love and care about? If Jesus has this incredible power to raise the dead, to heal the sick, then why not here and now for those we deeply care about? Why not? Always when we get into these stories of healing in the Gospels, we're confronted with that question for our own lives and faith. We're asked to believe. We're even forced to believe as we're confronted with these stories. Jesus says to that woman who reached through the crowd to touch his robe, woman, your faith has made you well. Go and be healed of your disease. Wow. So let me see if I understand this right from a logical point of view. If Jesus says to this woman that her faith has made her well, and we are not well, the conclusion seems to be that we didn't have enough faith. Because if we only had more faith, we would then be made well, and Jesus' power would be manifest in our lives, and everything would be fine. How about that? Are we done? Can I leave you with that today? Will you leave this place comforted, ready to be a witness to this powerful God? Or will you be left with more questions than answers? And sometimes that's just our human condition. We seem to have gotten ourselves into a bit of a, a tight spot in terms of our faith. But the reality is that all of us bring those kinds of questions to our relationship with God. Where are you? What are you doing? How are things going to work out? Could you do a little bit more of that good stuff? And all the rest of the grieving and affliction, we don't want to be happy. Why do bad things happen to good people is the human question when we're in the midst of it, either ourselves or others that we know and love. Why? Why doesn't God change it like Jesus did back then? Why not now? I'm open. See, because now I've set you up, haven't I? You think I'm going to answer that question, don't you? Oh, I wish that I were wise enough, right? I wish that I were wise enough. But we can't leave it hanging there because we need some answer to that question of ours that comes from our heart. We need some peace to find resolution for our struggle of faith. What is it that sets Jairus apart? <laughs> 
what is it that sets this woman apart? I was thinking today about um, Independence Day coming up. I had once received an email, maybe you did too, it was going around, about how the signers of the Declaration of Independence, the consequences that they faced because they signed the Declaration of Independence. And they're pretty drastic. I, I, uh, I don't have the email handy, but it was like five of them were arrested or were caught in battle, tortured, and, and died. Um, others had their houses ransacked. One lost two of his sons in battle. Another had two of them captured. And, and it was just an amazing sense of what the signers of the Declaration, the consequences for their action, the price that they paid. So I wanted to make sure I gave you guys good information this morning. And uh, I made sure, I, I started to check it out and made sure that these stories were true. Guess what? Not so true as it turns out. The story was dramatized a little bit, embellished. If you receive that email, it turns out that probably 90% of it is not true and the other 10% is fudged. And I thought, well, there goes a wonderful sermon illustration right down the tubes. What distinguishes Jairus? What distinguishes the woman who touched Jesus? And what distinguishes those signers of the Declaration of Independence? I was disappointed, in a way, to find out that the price that I had thought they paid, they didn't actually pay. But at the moment that they put pen to paper, did they know that? When Jairus leaves his house that morning, because he hears that Jesus is in the neighborhood, when he's tried everything he absolutely can, prayer, physicians, the help of the local midwife who knew something about health, when he's tried everything that he absolutely can for his daughter and nothing works, what sets him apart? And remember, Jairus seeking out Jesus is not you and me, it's not like you and me praying to Jesus, could you just do this? Jesus, at the time that Jairus is the leader of the synagogue, is an unknown quantity. He's unstable. He's this radical preacher who's stirring things up, who's doing these amazing things that make people wonder, and we see this elsewhere in the Gospel, who is he really working for? Is he on the side of God or Satan? So for Jairus to walk out of his house that morning and seek out Jesus for the health of his daughter is a huge risk. He's the leader of the synagogue, and he could completely discredit himself by siding with this man, Jesus, and get no possible benefit out of it if Jesus cannot do what Jairus believes he can do. You see, the minute Jairus steps out the door of his home, he puts everything on the line for the sake of his love for his daughter. His own standing in the community, his own credibility, his own hope. The same thing is true of the woman who reaches for Jesus' robe in the midst of that crowd. We don't know exactly what the source of her disease was, what the nature of it was. But the fact of the matter is, and you can read it in Leviticus, that the fact that this woman had this disease meant that she should not be in human company. And yet there she is in the midst of the crowd probably by some in the crowd, easily identifiable as the woman with the disease, who should not be around because she'll make everybody else unclean. So to appear in that crowd, she takes this huge risk of even greater isolation in her society, of people mocking her and, and forcing her away because she's putting them all in jeopardy. And yet, despite that risk, and after 12 years of hoping to be made well, she puts herself out. And lo and behold, she is healed. She takes a risk to confront God on God's own terms in the person of Jesus and finds healing. Jairus takes a risk not knowing the outcome for the sake of the love for his daughter and his trust in this man, Jesus, and indeed receives his daughter back. The signers of the Declaration of Independence took a risk that putting pen to paper 
were not causing them to lose everything that was dear and important to them. And the outcome of that risk, here we are today, living in this wonderful country, cherishing those freedoms that they first had a vision for, wanting to perpetuate them for generations to come. They took a risk, and it paid off. I'm kind of amazed at the story in Mark's Gospel where Jesus goes and, and first he has this confrontation with the woman that he heals, or at least a conversation, and she tells him everything. She was willing to be vulnerable with him and found deep healing, not just for her body, but for her spirit as well. I think that the most important point of that healing comes in that one word that Jesus says to her. Do you notice that in this story, the women have no names? We never find out the name of Jairus' little daughter. We never find out the name of this woman who comes to touch Jesus in the midst of the crowd. Why is that? Well, don't throw anything at me yet. It's because they were women, females, second class. Most point, in most cases, property, possessions. They belonged to a man. They didn't need a name. If you knew their husband's name, their father's name, that was enough. But here in this story, I think the deepest healing comes from the, for the woman in particular, when Jesus, in a sense, names her and says to her, daughter. She is a woman in relationship. Not in relationship to a man, but in relationship to God. He says to her, daughter. And what he means is, child of God. Your faith has made you well. And in that naming of her, he gives her a place above others. Because she understands that what's important to her is not this one particular disease or her anonymity in the midst of her society or the risk that she poses to others, but that God notices her, cares about her, and indeed heals her. Daughter. And she finds wholeness. To the little girl, Jesus says to her, Talitha, Aramaic, Talitha kum, which means little girl, little child, get up. Jesus, in a sense, names her too, little child. And in that naming of her and that raising of her, she and her parents find healing way beyond the physical. Now, one of the things that we understand about Jesus and his mission and ministry is that he could certainly go on from person to person and heal this one and that one and continue that. But there came a point in that ministry that Jesus himself knew from the very beginning where the healing that he would bring would have to be bigger than that. Where the grace that he was able to touch lives with would have to be worldwide. And he understood that it was that desire to do his Father's will, to bring healing to the world that would lead him to the cross so that he too might be resurrected and bring that power of healing and hope to the entire world. Does Jesus continue to heal people today? Yes, I think so. Does it happen to those we want it to happen to? Not always. Does that break our hearts? Do we ask that question of the, of the author of Lamentations, where and why, oh God? We do. That's our human question. But the hope is that we ask it of God, and that in faith we believe that healing comes to each and every one of us eventually. Maybe not the kind of healing that we hope for and anticipate at that moment, but rather a healing that is eternal, that is deep, that is life-giving in the endless sense. Is it what we want? No, not always. Do we wish that we could have those loved ones with us even now? Absolutely. But when we finally accept the answer, of an ultimate healing, then hopefully that too brings us peace and hope. It gives us encouragement. 
And in the meantime, as we continue to walk this journey of life, we'll struggle. Like that woman who risked everything and reached out and found that God could meet her need. We too are called to risk, to be vulnerable to God, to reach out with all the desires of our heart, the hopes of our lives, and to find out, as I know you will, that God is not wanting, but that God is loving and can meet those challenges, can heal you in time. Through the grace of Christ, who says to each one of us, I say to you, little child, arise, have hope, life wins. Amen.